Welcome to Portable's webinar on remote design research, how to connect with your users and co-design online. Whilst we have some people um, starting to settle in and join us, we'll give it a couple of minutes um, and we'll start the introductions and the overview in a, in a couple of minutes. All right, hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is our second go at um, a portable webinar on remote design research, how to connect with your users and co-design online. So um, we'll start with the introductions and an overview and um, we'd like to begin today's meeting by acknowledging that we at Portable live and work on the lands of the Wurundjeri people and the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to the elders past and present and emerging, and we extend our respects to those First Nations people who are joining us today. And personally, I grew up on Ngunnawal land in Canberra and called this home until I moved to Wurundjeri land to find a home here in Melbourne. It's become my home and it's a place I'm grateful to return to whenever I venture out in the world, which is not very often these days. <laughs> um, I'm going to briefly hand over to the panelists who are joining me. Uh, I'm Sarah Kaur, the Chief Strategy Officer at Portable, and I'll hand over to Ashling Costello to introduce herself. Hi everyone, I'm Ashling, originally hailing from Ireland. I'm a design strategist at Portable. And I am very excited to hear from you, the community today, on how you've been tackling some of the topics we're going to talk about. I'm going to pass over now to my um, friend and colleague, Adam. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Adam Corcoran. I'm a senior design strategist at Portable. Uh, I'm really looking forward to sharing some of the things we've already learned. We've already learned things in the past week since the first webinar. And we're going to be continuing to learn and share what we learn as we go through this uh, new time that we're all in. Um, thanks so much for the intros. Back to you, Sarah. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Ashling. Um, all right, so just a bit of housekeeping before we get into what the webinar is going to cover. Uh, welcome to Zoom. It's our chosen platform for the webinar today. It's got a couple of features for most people who are in attendance. Um, so you should be able to see if you were one of the first hundred attendees, um, a Q&A and a chat panel. So we'll ask you to post any questions that you have and feel free to direct them to particular panelists via the Q&A window and to use the chat window for comments, discussions, throwing things out there as you um, have um, observations about what's being presented. And it's a really a space for community chat and discussion. So um, that's how we are going to be tackling Q&A and chat. As we go, we will be trying to answer Q&A as relevant by each of the panelists, but we also will try and reserve about 10 minutes at the end to tackle any of the Q&A questions that we haven't been able to get to within the course of the presentation. So on the next slide, um, skipping past, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. So we're currently in the introductions and overview, and then we start to see a whole list of P's. <laughs> so we are talking about uh, really co-design online work, uh, workshops. What is their purpose? How do we go about proposing that? Who are participants we might wanna have? What kind of planning do we need to do? How do we put it all together? 
what are we talking about when we say pulling it off? What happens post an online co-design workshop? What are some key principles and takeaways that if you um, don't walk away with anything else, you at least get to take away some really handy tips. And then we'll be going into the Q&A. Um, so on the next slide, uh, just to reiterate for anyone who's just joined us, the Q&A panel is where to post questions and the chat panel is where you can basically have an open discussion with everyone here. Okay, so what is this all about? Never before has the design world needed to pivot so responsively to remote ways of working. With the precautions of COVID-19 ruling out in-person gatherings for many workplaces, one of the more challenging activities will be conducting our beloved practice of co-design. Ever since the emergence of Google Ventures Design Sprint, we've been fine-tuning our workshop design facilitation skills to support the best experiences for participants gathered in a room like this one around a desk often uh, creating paper prototypes and clustering around a sketch um, and thinking about how to create a safe physical environment to bring the experiences of people with lived experience to the fore so now I want to quickly think about what um, two terms mean to portable and invite you on the chat to comment whether you have the same or a different experience. But to us, design research means uh, the work of sitting in the problem space with empathy for the people we are designing for. We explore the experiences of people through a number of activities and techniques. And this usually leads us to uncover user needs and pain points for people, along with the potential opportunities for improvement. And by co-design, what we mean is a participatory approach to design that actively involves employees, business partners, customers, experts, and end users in the design process to help ensure that the result meets their needs and is usable. So what happens when the world as we know it shifts and designers now need to support co-creation activities with a really diverse range of humans online? Um, in the next hour or 50 minutes or so, we will be covering some common co-design activities like journey mapping, prioritization, and ideation <clears throat> through the use of simple video interactions and some more sophisticated collaborative online tools. We'll be covering what the remote workshop means for the roles of a facilitator and some additional roles such as a tech support person. We'll be thinking about the cadence and the timing of activities and how to help participants build confidence to co-create with designers step-by-step um, step in a video conferencing platform. We'll be thinking about how to recruit, screen, and prepare users to participate online before the workshop starts. We'll be touching on some inclusive design principles to adopt in the video conferencing environment and thinking about um, extra considerations such as the privacy of participants in an online setting. Uh, about Portable, so we are a company, we work out of Collingwood. Our mission is to seek out areas of social need and policy failure to create transformational change using research, design and technology. There are about 45 of us, um, nine producers, 20 researchers and designers, 14 developers and one data scientist. Before moving on, I just wanted to touch on something called the SAMA model. Um, so we're really talking about a, a, a shift and a transformation from a face-to-face -face default setting to an online one. And I wanted to introduce the SAMA model because it gives us a couple of layers um, in order as designers to interrogate what we're doing and whether we need to adopt a facsimile or a transformative approach to some of the activities we'll be um, undertaking. So Dr. Ruben Pundentra's SAMA model was developed for the education sector originally. It's a framework that incorporates four degrees to which technology can be integrated into a learning environment. It's particularly relevant, I think, as we face school closures in Australia. So, or blended learning environments indeed. Um, what, so we consider this whenever we take on a project that involves educational technologies. And for that reason, we think it's quite important to talk about and think about during this webinar. So the point of the SAMA model is not always to aim for the redefinition stage, 
or are down the bottom. So not always to aim for that stage by default. It's more to acknowledge and work with the stage that you are realistically working in. So we'll illustrate this through thinking about the art of creating an essay. So we've got S for substitution, where technology directly replaces a really old school quill like um, and paper with little functional change. So that would be using a pen. So pen becomes the technology that substitutes a quill and paper. Next, we've got A, augmentation. So this is where technology um, directly replaces the pen and paper with some functional change. So that would perhaps be a typewriter instead. We look at modification or M in the model where a significant task redesign occurs through the technology. So this could be thought of as the word processor complete with spell checks, automated referencing and tables of content. And finally, redefinition is where tech provides new tasks that have never existed before. So that would be something like the collaborative cloud-based environment um, and document tools such as Google Docs, where co-writers can collaborate, give feedback and share the writing more widely all in real time. Um, it's important to know that it's a relative concept and the example that we talked about with a pen going to Oh, sorry, quill going to pen, going to a typewriter, going into a cloud document. It really could start with the humble word processor, but end up with an online and interactive citizen journalism platform. It can really be so transformative and important to think about. And we think that this model takes a really optimistic lens for the current challenge that we're faced with. So from remote working, what tools and techniques could put us further towards the transformation end of the spectrum? That's kind of the, the current question that's occupying a lot of portable uh, designers at the moment. On the next slide, why are we sharing this now? Definitely it's about um, COVID-19, but I don't really want to speak too much about it. It definitely feels saturated through almost every interaction, but I wanted to acknowledge the profound impact that it's had on our professional ways of working and our social ways of being. Um, there's a sense of urgency that we at Portable had to share this content with you now um, with the community, even if it's a bit rough and ready. So this is a very cheeky look at um, Google's trend analysis. Uh, a couple of, about a week or so ago, a trend exploration looking at the interest levels in search terms on remote design, online collaboration, video conference and co-design. So you can see that there's a really massive spike in recent days, which I entirely expected for remote design, online collaboration and video conferencing. But I was, you know, pleasantly surprised that co-design is also taking a lift. I don't know why exactly, but I think um, it's starting to shift to many of the practices, not only for co-design workshops, but many of, but in exploring a co-design workshop, we're able to explore the um, practices that we need to shift into for meetings in organizations and teams where you don't have easy access to a whiteboard to simply scribble things on anymore on a physical wall. Um, we think that there are many opportunities in co-design and in remote working. So the epitome of the contextual research is speaking to people in spaces they feel most comfortable in. And there are even some tools that might be able to be um, leveraged and thought about using the same uh, uh, model that provide better experiences and outputs than the face-to-face -face alternatives. We also have the potential to reach people who wouldn't normally sign up. Uh, I do wanna acknowledge that it's a double-sided coin because going online, you might definitely be um, not able to reach everyone that you normally can. I think there's a, um, a tendency to first of all think, uh, I only can work now with digitally savvy people or tech savvy users, but we want to actively challenge that. Um, a, couple of, a couple of examples come to mind where about reaching people where we wouldn't normally um, and, and making a safe space for them online. We know that young men discuss um, or don't like to discuss so-called embarrassing issues like premature balding or depression. By no means do we think of them as embarrassing, but they um, young men can find it a lot easier to express themselves online um, in their home comforts with a facilitator who is responsive and empathetic. 
And people who are spread far from us geographically, people in regional areas, if we actually all go remote um, and participate participate remotely by default, that's a more democratic and probably better experience for all of them rather than having to have a blended meeting where some participants are face to face and then those in remote areas um, are the only ones joining over video. So let's always think about how to challenge and be creative about thinking about how to make uh, online and remote participation possible. Um, another example that comes to mind and that we were actually asked about in one of the Q, uh, the questions sent prior to this starting was about how to work with older Australians. So we do know um, from an ABC survey that 84% of Australians that are over the age of 75 have a smartphone and they will check it at least once a day. And like many of us, they feel like it's a very central way to connect. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's especially true now um, during a period of social distancing. So how do we design a text-based co-design workshop and keep it structured to be an exchange of information, ideas and stories that's purely based on text or emojis? So audio recordings, video recordings. We can think about some additional support questions like do older Australians have someone who is more digitally literate in their household who could help them get set up, make things more comfortable, potentially hold the camera for them or help them, you know, type with the tiny keys that can be really hard for people with who are losing mobility. Is remote potentially more suitable for people who use assistive technologies to access the internet with their computers or the people who would usually never fill out a participant recruitment screener but now they do because they're sitting out a two-week quarantine period it's nice to think that maybe a productive serotonin release um, as they dial in to talk to someone about their experiences could actually be really beneficial so this is where we get to be as designers incredibly creative and resourceful so that we can include valuable experiences of users who may not um, appear accessible to us at, at first blush. Um, I wanted to acknowledge that a lot of things will change a little bit, but there's a fair few things that really won't be changing too much. Um, so things like getting the right people to do a co-design um, workshop with, figuring out the right level of engagement and how to design an appropriate supportive um, scaffolding experience for that, how to go from having a highly structured plan to loosening up and going with the flow during a workshop, and how to synthesize a wild variety of assets and discussion points. All of those things we practice now face-to-face -face and continue to practice um, online or remotely. And in putting this content together, we have very much relied on, um, on a report that Portable's releasing this week. It's called the Co-Design with Purpose Report. And if you haven't already signed up to our newsletter, um, please, please sign up and receive this. The content in this webinar is actually going to be developed into a, a companion guide um, where this focus is very much on the um, gen general co-design with purpose, this um, additional content is going to be made available down the track to think about how it's delivered online. And so co-design with purpose, what is the purpose of the co-design workshop that you are planning right now? Uh, this, like many things, doesn't change. We want to make sure that you are very clearly able to articulate what you want out of it, what you want the participants to get out of it, and if you've got the opportunity to have participants tell you in advance so um, they can say what they like out of it is even better. And of course, what your stakeholders want out of it. So let's be clear on the purpose before we go any further. Um, and we, speaking of excuse me, stakeholders, we really want to understand that this might be a new and a transition kind of stage that we're feeling. And so proposing the idea that you can move from a face-to-face -to, -face to an online workshop might require some engagement with your stakeholders or your clients, and you want to be offering them confidence and assurance. Um, if we flick to the next slide, we actually see a quote from one of our portable producers, Angie, so she's really highlighting here that, um, that so far our interactions with stakeholders and clients have been very positive. They see it as 
um, as a confident step in the right direction to deliver work. They do have questions about the logistics, the tools, how troubleshooting will work um, and how recruitment works. And I think that there's a lot in this, in this webinar that allows you to plan and put that forward in a really reassuring way for your stakeholders and propose making a shift to an online um, co-design workshop. So we now start to think about the participants. Who is going to be in the room, in the virtual room? Uh, of course, we are going to have people with lived experience or um, users or end users. So one really interesting thing um, to call into question is, are all of your users needed at the same workshop at exactly the same time? So I think it's really important to ask a central question, like what is the experience that that you as a facilitator or a designer want to bring participants together for and to experience. Um, for us, and looking at code design, the value is in its mix of ideas and discussion viewpoints. And um, seeing that is very beneficial because the discussion and the various perspectives that all of the um, users and participants hold um, can help each other hear different points of view, help build empathy, for yourself and them, um, help to gain insights about the various possibilities. And, and these are all really um, crucial elements, I think, in collaboration and then being able to move forward into co-creation. So if we think about collaboration being a central point about bringing people together, one of the things we still have to ask ourselves is, is the best way to do this by having multiple people in the same room and in the same space at one time? could actually we think about space and, and virtual spaces being a mindset? So could we think about the thoughts of our participants being articulated at different times by individuals in things like diary studies? Um, and how could we actually encourage them to share those observations as they go about during a day um, or responding to a prompt into a central hub? So something simple like WhatsApp or Messenger or a group email. This kind of mindset of having spaces that you work in throughout the day and publish to, this could be set up in advance of a group coming together in a workshop and could actually help to establish a sense of rapport. So as well as um, users will have subject matter experts, they could be brought in at different times to inject confidence in a subject, uh, also to co-create a specific thing that's particular to their domain, or to provide feedback to participants on how their ideas may or may not be feasible. Um, so for example, what a lightning talk does in a design sprint um, or citizen speed dating in a government lightning decision jam. Uh, we also have the possibility of inviting stakeholders and often they do want to be involved. Um, one of the things we would recommend is, uh, is not having them observe. I think there's a particular um, it could be very easy for stakeholders simply to observe a, um, a workshop over video conference instead of participating. But just like in, in real life or face to face, it can be a little bit threatening to have the sense of being watched as a participant. So we'd invite you to ask them to be helping the participants or helping you scribe or document. So now we start to talk about our team, the team delivering and planning the um, the workshop. So we have a facilitator, we um, understand that very well, but this facilitator will also be playing a couple of other roles or, or have another couple of facets. So they will be playing a presenter and a moderator. So just in real life, you are hosting the meeting, you are creating a safe environment. And this means that we'll maybe be able to learn a few tricks from online forum moderators. So tricks like looking out for antisocial behaviors in chat threads, or verbally or even visually as participants um, have audio and visual kind of participation. So these facilitators typically have the deepest understanding of the activity of how they'll be run or how they'll need to be hacked to run to achieve the desired outcomes. Uh, facilitators will be able to pivot and to respond to events in real time and give guidance to the other participants and facilitators. We think, um, or we'd recommend there's another role of a scribe. 
And depending on, um, on the level of comfort, a client or a stakeholder who wants to participate might act as a scribe. Uh, a scribe is helpful for also responding to questions and answers throughout a webinar or a chat scenario in a workshop. And they're really responsible for scribing down and um, making sure they're capturing discussion points and assets. And of course, technical support, because not everything will go right the very first time around. Um, and we've got a, a couple of slight rule of thumb um, suggestions for how many of these different roles you might want to have, depending on how big your workshop is. And finally, when we think about participants, um, we want to stress the point um, about being inclusive, stressing inclusivity and not exclusivity. We take inclusive design very seriously and we remember that it's, it's our job to make the service or experience accessible to as many people as we can um, or to as many people as our clients really want to reach and support. Um, for Portable particularly, we work a lot with government um, at the state and federal level and usually that means that our users come in all um, shapes and sizes and backgrounds and circumstances and identities, and that many of these factors may be quite fluid, especially right now. Some things that you can do to have, um, to be more inclusive for participants is to consider time zones, timelines, and time constraints. To think about using low bandwidth tools, so being able to switch off video if you're having trouble um, streaming or not enough bandwidth coming through. To think about democratic participation, so uh, relying on the principle that if it's going to be remote, all participants are remote to keep it quite democratic. Um, being uh, allowing people to use their own devices where they feel comfortable and remembering that designing for accessibility um, is, is very deep and very big and you don't need to feel like you need to have everything nailed um, to begin. Some things on the next slide that we can do to be more accessible um, for participants, including allowing participants to work at their own pace within a time frame. Uh, being given very clear instructions on how to use tools in advance and also um, check-ins by the facilitators or the scribe. Um, you might even want to think about leaving the instructions up on, the, on your um, broadcast channel. And also, as, as alongside the instructions, thinking about having an example of the completed activity um, in order to show them what they're working towards and also show what contribution looks like. So show that they might be contributing through text, through a collage and, and not being afraid to take your time to thoroughly explain that. So <clears throat> I think that finally we want to talk a little bit about where to find participants, all of the usual channels, I think, and a couple of extras. Um, we wanted to call out our recruiters like Focus People or Farron if you're working in the Melbourne or Australia zone um, and increasingly crowdsource tools um, such as Usability Hub and DScout will allow you to find um, participants who are already online. And uh, on the next slide, it's been really interesting to see how recruiters um, have also been picking up and responding and saying, yes, we have people who are really willing and ready to, to do this online. Um, and they can use Skype, Google Hangout, WhatsApp, Zoom. People are already starting to change and be very open to this. Um, on the next slide, we have things to consider when screening for participants. So ideally, we will have um, participants with a stable internet connection Next slide, access to a laptop or a desktop, and ideally a webcam and a mic. Some confidence typing using a mouse and talking to people over webcam. Let's face it, we're all you know, getting used to the new world of, of video conferencing and access to a well-lit and relatively um, well soundproof room where they will have privacy or at least not be interrupted by other people. Um, Hopefully familiarity with working on their computer or having someone else around them who does and a backup phone number is really important in case of a technical fault. Finally, a personal way to reach them. So over Gmail uh, or any email account and experience with document sharing is a real plus. Finally, an open mind and enthusiasm because that's always amazing. and We want to encourage it everywhere. Um, and I'll throw you now to Ashling to talk us through the planning stages of a code design online. Hi, everybody. 
Um, I just want to say thank you to the people who are popping in some great questions into the Q&A. There's some really good thoughts that are coming through and some of the questions uh, we're going to we're going to actually talk about now and that's in relation to what activities that we, we can run when doing remote design work. Um, alrighty, so planning. Um, you have your stakeholder support, you have recruited your participants and now you need something foolproof plan because as we know things often don't go as planned so how do you create plans to mitigate when things go wrong um, there are three key bits that seem to be the most important let's talk about timing let's talk about how as a facilitator you keep all of those virtual plates spinning um, and in place uh, when we run a face-to-face workshop we often think about time boxing and making sure everything is to time so we don't run over and we're able to achieve the quality that we want to achieve and we make sure our participants are also achieving the things they want to achieve. Uh, it's no different when it comes to running an online or a remote workshop but what might be important to include are frequent breaks because Zoom calls get quite tiring which I think is something we're, we're all experiencing uh, between last week and this week. So we're trying to strike a balance between shorter activities, frequent breaks, but also achieving those desired outcomes. And when we talk about desired outcomes, as Sarah mentioned earlier, when we asked the question, is, is a workshop the way to go? We're trying to figure out what do you as the facilitator or the design team, what do you want to learn? What do you need to learn? What does your client need to hear? What do they need to get out of it? What do your participants want to learn or what kind of experience do they want to have? What does good quality look like for them? And this is really important because we can learn a lot when we ask participants, what would you like to get out of this? And then help them reflect to say, was that achieved? Because if it, if it wasn't, then maybe we can learn how to change how we created that workshop to achieve that desired outcome. Participant experience. Um, a great question has come through in the Q&A and how you create that trust space, especially when it comes to vulnerable users. And one way that we do this in a physical workshop is we set up room rules that everybody um, collaborates to create. Things like don't over talk people, respect points of view and opinions, especially when it's coming from a place of a, a lived experience. When we go online, we think of it as online etiquette. So when do you mute your mic and why? How do you allow your participants to co-author this? Um, you build that timing into the workshop activities. When we think about tools, make sure everybody is comfortable and give them frequent reminders on how to use the tool, what the shortcuts are. And if tools are not your strength, if tech is not really your strength, that's quite okay. In fact, that's, that's awesome. That means that as you learn, everybody will benefit. It might be good to bring that tech facilitator in so they understand what activities you're trying to run and they have their backup plans and their instructions written. Um, but also don't be afraid to test it with your peers, your partner, your parents. Practice makes perfect, but we're never really going to get to perfect again, near foolproof plan. Activities, give clear instructions. You might need to give them again and again. You might need to verbalize them. You might need to post them into the chat on a list of one to 10 you might need to have them visible on screen at all times. Everybody learns in a different way and that's okay. Also show what finish looks like, show what contribution looks like. Um, the here's one I baked earlier approach works really, really well. On the next slide, we've got an example of a timeline or a checklist of activities to communicate to the client all of the effort involved to get from, hey guys, we've had this great idea. We're gonna do this remotely or we need to do this remotely to, high five with the client because the workshop is done. And we're also indicating here who is responsible for what. What is the designer creating? What is the client reviewing and sharing? When we think about common co-design activities and how we might facilitate them online, it's really important to remember as we have a chat about these that we've split them into two groups. One is the basic. And it's not quite just that it's um, maybe a common tool but that it's handy for participants who have nearly no experience with a tool or an activity. As designers, as working professionals in our different areas of expertise, we often get hung up on our specific languages that can be quite technical. 
Um, when we talk about basic tools, it's about understanding what our participants are already using and how we can bring our activities into those tools. When we talk about advanced, this is uh, handy for participants who are comfortable with a similar tool or activity. Take, for example, um, business analysts who might be part of your stakeholder group, the client group that you're liaising with. They might be comfortable with a tool like Visio, where they create their business process diagrams. And as a designer, I can look at that tool and say, oh, I could build a journey map in that. So maybe this analyst to use that tool but bring my activity into their area of expertise. So what do we usually do when we want to understand a user's experience with a product or service? Maybe, maybe one of the first things that comes to mind is the journey map. And a journey map can take many flavors. It can map the past, it can uncover the present, or it can help us chart the future. And this is the future of a user's experience with a product or a service or an entire landscape offered by an organization. Our list of basic tools here leverages things that are open source or easy to access. But for some organizations, they might prefer to use the tools that they consider to have um, less, uh, that, that they consider to be secure or that align with their uh, data security strategy. If that's the case, that's quite all right. Just learn to understand what the tools are, why they're in place, why there are restrictions, and then um, fit your activities to their constraints. Uh, here in our image, you can see that we've actually created a journey map um, with common horizontals and common uh, verticals uh, in um, Google, Google Sheets, which I think prior to going remote, we might have thought it was a nightmare. But when, we, when testing this, it actually kind of worked out. <laughs> um, on the next slide, we can see some advanced tools. And here we have some common design culprits. We have Mural, Miro, Lucidchart. And as I mentioned earlier, we have Visio. Uh, the example that I have on screen is actually the Miro um, template for a typical journey map with some of the verticals removed. And this is, just, this is showing that it's quite easy to pick up the tool and use some existing templates. Another way that you can begin to understand users' experience with a product or service is to use an empathy mapping exercise. And an empathy map helps us understand user needs and also how users might interact with a product or service. And they are especially helpful for uncovering insights when you interact with end users of the product or service. So not just the client or maybe some other people within the organization, but the frontline staff that are servicing the users and the users themselves. Here, our basic tools focus around asking the right questions of end users with the facilitator, maybe in this case me, running the activity, filling in the empathy map myself, or setting up the activity for the end users to maybe annotate using a video call. So if you set up a Zoom meeting, you can annotate and a person could type in their response while on the call. Um, this would require a bit more synthing on my behalf. Synthing is the process of taking those insights and um, creating that uh, desired output and outcome from the activity. Uh, but then you'll see with our advanced tools, you get into a lot more uh, participant um, participation, I guess, um, because they're adding their information directly into the tool. And here I've added a screenshot on what Visio looks like. It's kind of like a whiteboard, but everything tends to stick to the grid. So you have less um, vector artwork that you would have with something like Miro or, um, or Mural. What do we usually do when we want to gather firsthand accounts of people's lived experiences? And the example that I have, the example activity is called an anecdote circle. And if you haven't heard of it, I would highly recommend Googling this term and maybe looking at groups like Authentic Revolution to see how they facilitate different flavors of anecdote circles. What it is, it's a form of shared storytelling. So people gather together and a facilitator like myself might ask a question that would prompt um, people within the circle to speak from a place of lived experience. So a good example is when we ran this with a group of vulnerable users who are all, for, um, uh, all from a category that we would call older people or older persons. 
And a, a question I might ask would be, um, can you tell me about a time in your life when you felt compassionate or you, you felt compassion um, or you benefited from the compassion of another person? And because of my framing of the question, I am prompting that person to respond from, oh yeah, I remember when I was such an age, this event happened. You can use techniques um, like playing back and reframing to bring pe some people's tangents back into focus so that you're still uncovering the types of things that, um, that you need to uncover to achieve that learning outcome. And it's also a good way to show that you've, you've heard, um, you've listened, and you appreciate that person for sharing. If anybody has any questions about anecdote circles or any of the activities or tools so far, please feel free to pop them into the chat or the QA channel. Alrighty. What do we want to do when we want to collaborate with clients to identify and prioritize the challenges that they face? And how do we do this remotely? Um, one of the first activities that came to mind for this is a lightning decision jam, which is based on the service design jam uh, process. And a lightning decision jam can be as short as maybe 10 steps to as long as 30 different steps. And this is a process of identifying challenges that the client faces, creating or uh, reshaping them or reframing them into design challenges, uh, identify and prioritizing ways to solve that design challenge, and then creating solutions and steps. The end result is typically a backlog of um, design challenges to tackle, uh, steps to achieve or resolve those challenges and examples of solutions all um, with about one to three examples prioritized into a roadmap or timeline. And there's a couple of ways this can be done. A basic way to do this is to have quite a, um, a clear outlined um, set of slides that you would screen share across a Zoom call like today. But if you see on the advanced tools, I'm highlighting our usual culprits, but Miro has an excellent guide and they've created some um, templates that you can use as well. Alrighty. Um, on our next slide. I don't catching up. <laughs> oh yes, I'm just gonna highlight on that on the previous slide, Adam. Um, when you're using Miro, Miro have created a new setting. Uh, for people with global access uh, to be able to edit a mural board. It is in beta testing, but I can confirm that the can comment access is really helpful. It means that people don't have to log in and create an account and pay for an account or anything like that. They can just get straight into the tool. Um, and that's been really helpful when running it with external participants or customers. So what do we usually do when we want to learn how people sort and navigate information? So for some people, this might bring to mind information architecture, which is a key part of content creation and the structure of a prototype or product or service. And there's two activities that you can do, and they're often really helpful when you run one after the other. The first one is a card sort, and the second one is a tree test. And the basic tools that we have here were actually recommendations from our last webinar where somebody dialing in had used a spreadsheets because they are more accessible for people using assistive technologies. Rather than, uh, as you'll see later, we talk about our advanced tools, not all of which are accessible for people who are using assistive technologies like a screen reader. A card sort it can be run in one of two ways. You've got an open sort where you give people a big list of terminology. Think of them as maybe menu items or headlines in a newspaper. And you ask people to group them into logical categories. And then they give that category a name. Well, in a closed card sort, you've pre-created the categories as wee buckets. And then everybody needs to drag and drop um, each of those uh, line items into a bucket. It helps us understand how people categorize information. And then a tree test is an activity that you can run so that um, you can understand how people navigate uh, those buckets. So you'll see on the advanced tools list, we're recommending Optimal Sort and TreeJack. Uh, both are by a company called Optimal Workshop, which has some really, really good tutorials on how to use their tech. And um, it's web-based, so it's, it's set up for remote working. And also they have some really helpful analytics that you can use to understand how people sorted and how people parsed 
information. Um, Thank you, Angeline. Oh, sorry to cut you off. I've no, just realized okay. that um, in the interest of time, we might now throw to Adam to take us through putting it together, pulling it together, and then post. And Adam, I think you're still on mute. Thanks, Sarah. Is that better? Great. Great, thank you everyone. Um, thanks Ashling, for all those great ideas. It looked like it sparked a lot of sharing on the chats as well. So I'm gonna quickly whip us through putting it together and some principles before we um, take some questions from everyone. So of course, one of the big questions to start with is um, how are you gonna furnish your room? Uh, so in the past, we've had to focus on how do we organize the space we're gonna have people come into? How are we gonna furnish it appropriately? Um, now it's about choosing the platform and we've spoken a lot about uh, tailoring the platform to the needs of the audiences that you're actually working with. And I think that's a really important thing. Uh, for us as designers now, one of the tasks that falls onto our plate is familiarization with a whole lot of tools. Maybe it's none of these ones that we've got on the screen here, and maybe it's as simple as WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger, or even Instagram and Snapchat will probably become things. Um, I'm waiting to see the first person conduct a design meeting on the new House Party app, but I'm sure it's coming. Um, it's also important to consider how people are going to interact with you if they're in their own homes. So they have to be really familiar with what's going to be displayed, what's happening in their background, um, and whether they want to even show you anything else that's uh, important to your learning and how they feel about that. So consider the same sort of things as if you were doing contextual research in someone's home. Make sure they're really comfortable. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about building rapport soon as well. But it is important that um, acknowledging that this is actually going to be uh, the height of contextual research, where you're in a space with someone where they feel comfortable and they're able to be themselves. So it's a distinct opportunity of this way of working, I think, as well. Uh, a bit of an extension on this is about a, um, I guess, a, a little sort of comment from the design lead and of the Northern Trust Corporation about um, the deep curiosity that we have as designers and getting as close to our users as possible. Uh, where in the past it might have been then coming to your office for an interview, now it's actually um, pushed upon us that we may be in their home with them um, virtually, but able to learn a bit more about them as well. I'll whip through some of these other really quick putting it all together um, points. One of the big ones I think is about empathy, humility and humour. So it's always been a big soft skill task for us as design researchers to really build that trust and make people feel comfortable. If you're asking them to extend themselves to share something sensitive or something about their lives, why not show the example from yourself? So Ashton talked about what it actually looks like to deliver one of these things. That's a really important point. Maybe you send the video first and you show your vulnerability first. And I think that goes to a question we had in the chat earlier. Catering is obviously not an issue anymore. However, I think there's an important thing to acknowledge about the need for breaks and the need for food lifting mood. So keep in mind that um, you do need to still bring those breaks into place for people. Even as a company portable, we've uh, instilled some um, food rituals. We have a weekly breakfast for our designers. Uh, we've got um, regular lunch meetings where everyone can just catch up. And when we're doing one-to-one -one catch ups, that's a virtual walk around the block with a coffee. So um, keep that in mind as well. We don't have to forego our materials, props, and the other things that we often use creatively to, to have maker activities, but we may have to rely on people finding them in their own homes. There's a lot of household materials we can use, like pens and paper. There might be Lego lying around. And what other found items can we use and have on video with each other to represent different things that we're trying to learn from people? Lastly, I'll just point out about um, things that might be around the home. Uh, we can use things like magazines, just like we normally would, but think of reinventing collages. Is it a Google image search instead? Um, there's the old rule of, as well of uh, if people need to go away and, and do an activity, maybe wait for the iceberg to, so the ice cube to melt out of the freezer and that's a good way to time your activities as well so they don't get too long. And I always like the idea of diary studies as well. So uh, sending pre-packaged um, physical uh, activities to people can be great, but what does that look like virtually? Is it touching base every day with an instruction and the ability for people to respond to those instructions as well? 
And of course, the importance of music. So when we shared this last week, um, we had a person agree. I totally agree with this as well, that music can be a great trigger or signifier of when activities are taking place and when they're finished. So are you hosting the music from your own computer as the host on the webinar? Or are you just distributing maybe a Spotify playlist for everyone to use to get up their energy if they're doing a creative activity? So I think that's a really good one. And Kirsten in the chat said that um, it's a key mood setter. I couldn't agree more. I've got my favorite go-to Spotify playlists for the various types of activities that we run. Um, so that's how we can kind of pull it all together. And just a couple of last slides before we run into the principles. I'm sorry if my voice is running a bit faster than usual, just trying to get all of our thinking across for you in the time we've got left. Um, not much different to when you're running a in-person workshop, but there are some tweaks to be made and some tests to be done. We highly recommend dry runs. We've done them for every webinar we're doing. Um, and also, why not take the opportunity to reinvent some things here? So instead of the email invites that we spend time crafting and we send out to the participants and they've got clear instructions in them, maybe save some time and the time you would have spent writing, do a pre-call with uh, at least maybe one or two um, pre-calls to let people know about what technology you're using. Do some um, trial and error. See if everyone gets the uh, features that are available. It's always important, obviously, I keep talking about the soft skills. Hosting yourself and hosting others is always a skill that remote design researchers will need to have in their pocket, uh, even more so than when we were physical, in-person design researchers. So keeping that in mind is really important. Um, the good online etiquette, hopefully that follows from the things Ashling's talked about and the um, report building that I've been talking about as well. And be really sensitive of timing. That's always a struggle for us anyway. We've all been in workshops that we've probably run ourselves that have gone over time or we've had a learning about the timing that we've used. Um, and uh, making sure that you're just sensitive of that all the way through. Lastly, I'll just say that after the workshop, um, it's a great time to gather feedback, improve your approaches, sharing back the insights with people. I'm a big fan of distributing value back to your participants. So maybe sharing the tools you've used, sharing the frameworks, a lot of things out there now that we all rely on as design researchers are free. And I've often been in workshops where the participants have wanted to take up a tool and use it in their own world. And perhaps it's a great way to now um, pre-draft your prototype testing list. Are people from this workshop really gonna be keen to do the prototype testing? It's a great way to um, get people on board. Just doing a quick time check, and I think I'm gonna get us there with five minutes left for Q&A, but I wanted to talk about the principles that we have constructed as a result of this. They are open to change. They will be a living document for us to move forward with, and I'm sure we'll refine them over time in this new world of remote working. But of course, it's important to know and respect your participants and their comfort levels. Um, and be mindful of the varying levels of digital literacy and apply that inclusive design principle where it's not about catering to the most, it's about catering to the lowest level of ability to participate. So look at the edges of that curve and how can you make the workshop work for everyone, not just some majority in the middle. Uh, looking at as well um, the relationship between co-design and user research, there is a, a nuanced relationship between them. Um, and I think the considerations that we use for co-design online can also benefit how we do user research and vice versa. There's no one size fits all workshop. That's always been the case. And we're in a test and learn phase. Everyone will be. In fact, a little um, secret I'll let out. I'm always in a test and learn phase with the workshops that we actually conduct at Portable. I'm forever um, refining what I do. And I think it's worth having a bit of a uh, open mind and brave mindset to going ahead with all these sorts of things. It's always gonna work out better than you think it will. That's my experience with workshops. Um, be ready for plan B. So uh, don't, don't design for the happy path. We hear that all the time in our actual design work. Design for the path that may not be the one you wanna take because you will have to have a backup plan and technology is generally unpredictable. So make sure you've got something to keep your users engaged. And obviously collaboration is a big point here. So uh, the language of social distancing, picking up on that, 
that uh, can sometimes hint the wrong things to people. Make sure that your workshop is collaborative as possible and the activities that you're putting forth are able to be shared around so everyone feels like they're part of a team. Um, and also, how do we do the, I think we've ended up with the wrong slide in here. Um, I'll skip that one. Uh, continuously reflect and iterate, obviously really important. I've talked to that already. Um, let's improve this all together. Share back to us, we'll continue sharing with you how you're going running these workshops as well. So a uh, quote to finish with here, whilst co-design is a well and truly established field of practice, it's still also incredibly fertile ground for innovation. Now that was written before the current reality that we find ourselves in, and it's even more true now. In fact, we're probably used to innovating all the time as design researchers and co-designers. So now is the time to take brave steps forward and improve everything we're doing. And I really sincerely believe we're going to create some tools that will be permanent tools that we'll work through um, after this current phase of the way we're working has concluded. So thank you everyone for joining us. I'll hand back to Sarah now. We might host some last Q and A's before the time wraps up. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Ashling. Um, and so we've been going through a few of the Q and A's uh, posted to us. Might just really quickly um, speak through a few of them. So we were asked about best collaboration tools for remote designing. And I think at some point it was um, targeted uh, about UI tools. We didn't quite get to dive into it here, but we're thinking we've got three recommendations for you for UI tools for remote design collaboration. Uh, firstly, Envision. Uh, secondly, Sketch. And thirdly, Figma. These are all great. And they were in no particular order, by the way. We've, we've tended to use all three um, at different times. Um, for everyone who's signing off, thank you very much for joining us and, and for all the um, comments along the way. Uh, and also acknowledging that Figma for the win. It's a bit of a, bit of a Figma fan in the audience two maybe. Um, we've also talked a little bit about the online trust building and Ashling's uh, touched on it already, but thinking about expecting that it takes generally more time to create the safety space and establishing etiquette rules or room rules with the group is really important. Um, we had a question from Melanie speaking to the length of co-design sessions uh, when we move them online. Um, assuming that people have lower concentration spans, what can we do? Could we split them out? Um, and we've definitely found that things just seem to take longer online. <laughs> and uh, building in plenty of time padding as well as uh, frequent breaks for people to be allowed to step away from the computer and, and stretch it out. Um, and potentially as well splitting uh, via features like breakout rooms so that you could get smaller uh, groups of participants to be sharing instead of going in around Robin style can also be something to consider. Um, and a question about challenges, particularly when doing remote design work for private institutions and government institutions. Um, everyone at the moment is having to, to transition very quickly into new ways of working. And so I think it's all about us as designers being resourceful and, and providing reassurance and confidence wherever we can uh, to say, hey, it's no worries. Remote design might be the reality for the moment. So here's exactly what we plan to do. Here's how we plan to recruit people. Would you like me to walk you through one of the tools that we are actually planning on using? Um, one of the things as well to acknowledge is that some organizations have strict um, rules about security and, and how and who they allow into their kind of IT infrastructure and acknowledging that cloud-based technology may not be appropriate. And so I think as with, with anything, it's really important to be able to ask early what the constraints are and really work with your clients to determine and design the workshop early on that's going to be really appropriate. Um, all right, I don't think we've had any other open questions to go through, but feel free to post them and otherwise we'll probably be signing off in the next minute or so. 
Um, a reminder, if you're not already signed up to the newsletter, we'll be doing more um, webinars, more events, releasing the Co-Design with Purpose report. Um, I believe our next webinar is actually about accessing justice during the COVID-19 um, period. So watch out for that being announced as well. All right, Ashling and Adam, any other final words or tips, comments? Uh, for me, I'd just say thanks everyone for being such a collaborative audience and obviously jumping yourselves headfirst into a remote meeting tool um, and using it so well with us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, um, to echo what Adam has said, there's been so many helpful hints and tips added via the chat and the QA and follow-ups from people. And it's so good that this is a community initiative that everybody's contributing. Um, I think that's really important that we support each other and support the community with what we're learning and share back. Um, so thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. And yes, true, maybe a lunchtime webinar is a good, good suggestion for the next one. All right, thank you very much. Stay safe out there. Um, I heard a really great tip about not calling it social distancing, but calling it distance socializing. And I wanted to say, <laughs> yes, let's do more. <laughs> distant socializing and uh, treat ourselves well um, and not become too isolated so signing off for now thank you everyone thank you Ashley. bye everyone bye everybody take care thanks sarah thanks ashley <laughs>